Well, good evening, everyone. This is Bob the Science Guy from Shamrock Bank's Observatory in beautiful Central Michigan. Uh, I'm going to give everybody just a couple of minutes to check in real quick. Let me know How's whether or not... How's the chicken? The prawns are delicious. Oh, I have a shellfish allergy. One Hang prawn, on. very good. Did I say chicken wrong? Tired of people not listening to what you want? Yeah. yeah. The more we understand Obviously, you, the better we can help you. That's here. what U.S. Bank is for. Save your business time, money, and energy. All... Sorry about that. I uh, can't turn the sound on the uh, on the monitoring stream off until until it gets started, and I didn't get a chance to start to get over there and turn that off. But in the meantime, let's get back to where I was. Uh, what I want to do is let everybody check in real quick, and then I want to know whether or not you can see my cursor in the upper left of this screen. So here it is, right here. Let me know if you guys can see that. So we should have a little background music and you should be able to see everything here. Now on the left side of the screen with kind of the greenish background that is M101 which is called the Pinwheel Galaxy. And this is an interesting galaxy because I believe it was back in mid-July they discovered a new super, oh excuse me, it was in mid-May they discovered a new supernova in one of the arms of the galaxy. And if you look on the right, you'll see the black and white picture I took uh, about two weeks after they discovered it, and the supernova is labeled on it. So tonight, what I'm doing is I'm doing another imaging session of the same uh, galaxy. You may notice that it's rotated 90 degrees to the, in, a, in a counterclockwise direction. But if you look carefully, there is a little red dot where that supernova is. Okay, so you may not be able to see the cursor. That's just the way I'm set up tonight. You may not be able to see it. But what I can do is this. So, if you look right here, there is the supernova. You see the red bullseye. Now I'm just going to shift that off to the side a little bit so that you can see it. But that little red dot just to the right and just above the, cr the crosshairs there is the supernova. Now if you look over in the original image that I took, you'll see it was significantly brighter right after they discovered it. You see how it's starting to fade now and that was expected. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. If you can't see my cursor, I can put the bullseye on the screen for you to see. How's the audio coming through? Everything coming out okay? I don't see too much uh, in the chat. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me okay. Okay, excellent. But yes, you can definitely see the difference in the, in the intensity of the supernova. It was much brighter back in May when I took it originally compared to now. It's starting to fade quite a bit, and that was expected. They were thinking that it was going to be uh, fading by September, and here we are in September, and it is indeed fading. Okay, great. Audio's fine. Thank you. So I'm going to take this in the house so we don't have barking dogs. I'm going to stop by and grab a soda on my way in. And then, while you marvel at the wonders of the universe here, 
Uh, I'm going to get set up and I'm going to head on over and we're going to have a look at some comments tonight. Right now I'm testing some new equipment here. Uh, my original big telescope was a was a 20, 25 year old Mead 10 inch Smith Cassegrain telescope. And that's what we're using tonight. But I never got good imaging from it because the collimation was bad. Give me just a second, be right with you. Okay, I'm all settled now. So, Smith Cassegrins uh, have a problem that is common to all telescopes that operate by mirrors. Refractors, which just look through lenses, don't have a problem with this. But all, refractor, all reflector telescopes that use mirrors have to be collimated. Now, collimation means that you've got all of the mirrors lined up properly so that you get a single path of light going from the outside into the telescope, bounces off the primary mirror, goes up, hits the secondary mirror, and then bounces down to the eyepiece. Those all have to be lined up in order to get good focus. And I was never able to get good focus with this telescope until I got a Hotec Advanced SC collimator. And now that I've gotten that done, it's nearly uh, as good a focus as I get with the RASA. So, the advantage of this is that I've got five times the focal length and I can see things a lot uh, in a lot more detail. For example, this image that we're looking at right here of the, uh, the pinwheel galaxy, that's the full frame image. The one on the right was taken with the uh, Ritchie Crateon, which has a focal length of about oh, 1,600 millimeters, about 1,000 millimeters shorter than this one. And that had to be blown up quite a bit. So you see, I get a lot more detail and a lot more, um, a lot more pixels are involved uh, in the higher focal length image of the pinwheel galaxy than there were uh, with the lower focal length uh, telescope. So you go ahead and marvel at those things for a while. I'm going to go ahead and get the, uh, I'm going to get the uh, coordinates of the first comet. And we're going to go have a look at that. Okay, so I stopped the live stacking there. We've got our image. We're going to stop our um, tracking. You see our tracking is excellent tonight. We're at about 0.75 arc seconds. Looks like we've got a couple of fine clouds coming through here on the guide scope. Hopefully that won't cause a problem. We're supposed to be good until 3 a.m. tonight. <clears throat> so let's go back over here. We'll drop this down. We were doing three minute images. We're gonna go down here to about four seconds just to kind of get our bearings. And 
let's go on over to where the where the um, first comet is. We're all set up here. Now what's happening is the telescope is slewing over to the location of the comet based on my location on the Earth. That's my lat long and elevation. Pretty soon it'll say test complete. Then we'll see if the dome caught up and see where we are, what we're looking at. Okay, test is complete. Go back to live view. And there we are. So we are getting some stars here. Let's go see if we're pointing in the right direction. I'm using flats tonight, which is why all the little dust motes and the and the and the corners of the image are white. I'm taking flats, and that'll counter the vignetting and and the dust motes when we're taking the actual images. Now, if we can just solve this plate, we're going to be in good shape. We do have enough stars there. We should be able to get a solution. If not, we'll just kind of do it online and just kind of skin that cat from a different direction. There we go. We got a, we got a solution. We're only, uh, we're 0.36 degrees off, having slewn around, which isn't too bad. So now the telescope is going to move where I told it to be in the first place, not where it ended up. And there we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start doing some guiding. This was all set up last night. So what it'll do is it'll pick a star, like that one, and it'll lock onto it and keep the teles you know, keep the telescope pointing in a direction that keeps those crosshairs on that little star. Now we're gonna go on over here, we're gonna take our start taking images. So we're gonna go from four seconds up to three minutes. And we'll hit live stack. We're already set up with our target here. What we're going to do is just clear out this. And while that's clearing, we're going to go ahead and normalize these. Come on, clear. Okay, there we go. Let's normalize that. We'll take the stretch out uh, over here in the histogram. Likewise, we're going to take the stretch out here and here. Now we're just going to wait for that first image to come through. The comet should be more or less right in the center of the image. Now down in the extreme right lower corner, just above the date and time, you'll see a little orange bar down there, and that is the progress of the uh, exposure. So we're doing 180 second exposure. It looks like it's about a third done. Yep, about one minute. Now we'll just let it go. In the meantime, I'm gonna head on over to the YouTube channel and see what anybody's saying. Okay, we got Nick, we got Lone, we've got Judy. The faded circles with black center spots, Nick, Nico, are um, are dust motes. They're little specks of dust, either on the mirror, um, either on the primary mirror, on the secondary mirror, on the corrector plate in the front of the telescope, or on the um, 
glass covering of the telescope sensor. Take down that static image of the um, supernova that I got because, you know, we're looking at the main screen here now. Yeah, it's just dust. The telescope is in a dome out, out in the backyard, so there's constantly uh, you know, it's a constant fight to keep the dust and pollen and everything off of it. You know, the dome, of course, is closed when, it's, when I'm not actively observing, but still, all sorts of stuff gets in there. That's one of the reasons I switch out the telescopes every now and then is to clean the mirrors and such. We should be getting pretty close to our first image here. Okay, so there's our first image. Now what we'll do is we'll come up here to the stack. You see, see all the data on the histogram is way down here at the, um, at the extreme left of the histogram. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to white balance it. Then we're going to stretch it a little bit. There's the center of the image. Put a little magnif Now this may be a comet right here, right here, that spot. So now you see where it is. Let me turn this off. See, there's a little bit of fuzziness around it, but I'm not really impressed with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a series of images. And then uh, while we start imaging the next comet, we're going to run it through the Tycho software and process it, and it'll look for anything in it that's moving. We may pick it up with that if we don't see it here. Now the other nice thing is there's, there's an awful lot of stuff in this star field. We probably have some uh, asteroids there as well. So what I'm going to do is while we're just sitting here letting this, you know, letting these images roll on out, let's go over here to Tycho and load up this image that we just took. So we're going to take the second frame and load that into Tycho. Then we're going to go up here to uh, Express Mode. We need to debare the image because it's a color image and then we just want to plate solve it and that's really all we want to do. So let's go ahead and get that done. That should just take a moment or two. My guiding's bonging. Let me have a look here. I don't know why, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. 
There's a little cloud right there. I can see that. Okay, so it's already solved it. Let's go ahead and get the plate solved image. And that's in this file right here. And let's have a look at it. So here's the star field that we got. Now let's load up known objects. So it knows exactly where it's looking right now. It knows all of these stars in here. And it found two objects. One is a magnitude 23.8 asteroid. No way in hell we're going to see that. But that item right there is the comet. And as you can see, it was just off to the center. It's just off the center line at about 8 o'clock. And we're going to have a little closer look at it here. So it says that's where the comet should be. Now there's a couple of objects right next to that, but we don't see it just yet. So at least it's there. We know it's there. But that's the only object that we're going to get to see tonight. Or at least on this image run. Let's see if we can see it here. All right, I think I've got it. I'm thinking if you look at the crosshairs here, if you look to the left and then there's a little body that is just below the horizontal crosshair and it's just a little bit off I think that might be the comet. I guess we're going to have to see if it uh, moves. As you see, I've got a lot of astigmatism in the in the in the system here. This is actually pretty good focus. I mean, we're at a hundred percent right here, but we're getting a lot of this astigmatism in the stars. That just can't be helped. But we're definitely getting a lot here in the star fields. Let's see how many images we have. So we've only got nine minutes worth of data. We probably ought to let this run for a little while before we go on to the next one. They do recommend getting, uh, getting 20 to 30 images, which would be about an hour's worth of images. So if we're going to actually do the science on this and... Um, plot the orbit, we should at least get about 20 images going here. But we'll see. Let's give it about an hour total. We'll just kind of let it slowly uh, churn away here. This is what astronomy is. Just taking image after image after image and looking for stuff. At least we know we're right on the target. That is start that little object right there in the center. You know, if you look at where the crosshairs are, if you look at this object right here, that one, that's starting to look a little cometary. So look right where the crosshairs are, and then let me turn off this reticle. See how that one there just looks a little fuzzier than that one? I mean, that looks a little more cometary than the other one does. That could be a, an issue of timing. That could be an issue of the orbital elements are just very slightly off by a fraction of an arc second. This might be an opportunity to get a better orbit for this comet because, you know, the the software reads where the comet is supposed to be, 
and the camera records where it actually is. And it may be in a location that's a little bit off of what the predicted location was. And that's important to give orbital updates. But the camera's working really nice. The uh, focus is really good. I'll do this run and then I'll do another focus run on it and I'll show you how the focus works. But I'm so far I'm pretty pleased with the system tonight. I think it's working really well. As it gets later this evening, we'll have a look at some other objects. Uh, Orion will be coming up later on tonight. We'll be able to look at the Orion Nebula in glorious color. Um, we can look at Bodes in the Cigar Galaxies. Might find some other good galactic targets tonight. Don't you bite me, Missy. Cat's sitting here. I'm trying to scratch my cat and she keeps biting me. But if I stop, she reaches out and grabs me with her little, little paw to come back and scratch her some more. Cats don't know what they want. Well, I mean, that's the whole purpose of doing this splurge, and that is that, um, you know, I'm looking to discover comets and asteroids and near-Earth objects. Um, you know, and if you do discover one, and I have one that I'm following up that I found last night that's a little suspicious to me. I might have found a bogey last night. We're going to have a look tonight. Uh, when it gets a little bit later and it's above the horizon. And I'm going to go see if I can find it again. If it comes up again, it was a good strong hit. It was a really good strong hit, uh, but it wasn't associated with a known asteroid, but it looked like an asteroid. So we're going to have a look in the same spot again tonight, uh, or where the asteroid's, where it would be. And... Uh, we're going to see if we can find it again tonight. So that would be two observations. Uh, do another one in about a week. If I find it tonight, I'll do another one in a week and see where it is then. And then actually, that's a discovery. You know, you start off naming them after members of your family. Traditionally, after your spouse is the first one. And then you start naming it, uh, naming it after your, naming them after your kids, and then. I'm, I'm going to start naming them after prominent flat earthers. So we're going to have, you know, Nathan Oakley, 2023, uh, QE, 2023, Brian, or uh, Leakey, Leakey, 2024. I can, you know, that's the joy of finding these things. You can do with them what you want. Yeah, he is pretty good. But I always thought it was nice to have space deniers have objects named in space named after them. Starting to get a little bit of lightness on the uh, right side of the image here, I want to go see if the um, the uh, the opening, the shutter on the uh, observatory is not perfectly lined up with the telescope. You can see something like that. So I'm going to go check the alignment of that real quick. I'll be right back.
Well, it's lined up correctly, but it does look like we're getting some cl uh, some scattered clouds coming through, which could cause us a bit of a problem. <coughs> I'd like to see if I can get 11, sh uh, 11 images out of this run, because then I can run it through the uh, I can run it through uh, Tyco. But I've got to have at least 11 images. And right now we're at six. We'll see whether or not this will hold out for another 15 minutes. See, it's saying the comet's the one that's just below the horizontal crosshair, just to the left of the center there. It says that's the comet. But it doesn't really look all that inspiring to me right now. We'll see if it's moving. So I'll let it run for a few more minutes. We'll see if we get enough.
I'm going to leave those crosshairs up for a while. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and see whether or not they're right on the comet right now or what, what it's saying the comet is. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll come back in about 10 minutes and see if that object moved off the crosshairs. See, these are some clouds that are coming in here in the uh, right lower and on the lower side here. It's still locked onto the star, but as you can see, we've got a few clouds rolling through. As I said, it's supposed to be completely clear until 3 a.m., so these clouds kind of surprised me. They're kind of scattered, though. I don't think they're going to cause that much of a problem. See, these images still look pretty good. Like I said, we'll give it another 15 minutes and we should have enough images to stack and um, process them with that. So we'll let her go.
All right, well, we've got a few images here. It says that that should be the comet, but I think this one right here is the one that's moving. So let's see, how many images do we have? We've got a dozen images, 36 minutes. Almost done with this one here. That'll be 13. We'll do one more because 13 is unlucky and we'll do 14 images. That should give us a decent run. Then we'll run that through the stacking software. In the meantime, I'm going to get the other comet ready to go. So here are the coordinates of the other comet. Now why didn't it do that? There we go. Okay, so that one's all queued up. When this particular image run ends, we'll go ahead and uh, stop this live stack. Do a quick focus. And then we're going to head over to this other comet. Got about 40 seconds to go on this one, and then we'll stop that run. We'll slew, uh, we'll slew over to the other comment, and then we'll do a uh, quick focus. As the temperature changes during the night, the telescope will go out of focus, so you have to redo it every X number of degrees or about every 15 to 30 minutes. So we're kind of overdue for a focus right now. It's not bad, but I think it could be a little better. Okay, there we go. And that's that, so. Now we're going to head over to the other site. Turn off the guiding. There, the scope's moving now.
So there's the location of the scope. Up in the northwest. But it's pretty high in the sky, about 58 degrees up. Problem is, we've got clouds. Looks like they're passing now. here, get some four second shots, figure out where we are, we'll plate solve real quick, get the scope pointing in the right location. If we have enough stars here to plate solve, we'll see. Boy, there's a lot of dust motes on there, man. That's unfortunate. At least, at least it looks like the collimation's pretty good. That central dark spot is right in the middle, you know, especially. Uh, You know, like that one right there, you can see a really nice dark spot straight in the middle of that thing. One up in the corner looks good too. There we go. Hey, the plate solved. How do you like that? Again, I was 0.37 degrees off, so we're going to slew over to where we're supposed to be. So now we're over where we're supposed to be. We're going to take the camera off here for a second. Bring the camera up on this one and we're going to do a quick autofocus. Okay, camera's installed. That was our last autofocus. As you see, it looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and do one here now. See if we can get those stars a little crisper. that just take a couple of minutes. I'll let you guys watch that. And I'm going to go check the uh, chat. No, I didn't see the northern white. Hey, Eric. Yeah, I bet it did. I've seen some from Florida. I actually saw Apollo 17 launch from Florida, too. I could see that from 100 and 150 miles away. The thing was huge. See, we were uh, we were well below three. On the uh, on the focus, so looks like it's off a little bit now. So we're gonna have to try and get a get a little better focus here. We we're at about two point eight five, which is where we are right now.
See, these are still small white dots. That's good. I think we're at about 205,000 steps. So we're kind of, see it starts off a little bit higher, then it'll go down, it'll go through it, and then come out the other end. So you should see a nice valley or a V shape there. As you see, that's getting kind of irregular. I don't really like that. You know, if it wasn't for this one outlier here on the right, that wouldn't be too bad of a curve. But we're gonna see what it says. We're still below three, which is real good. You know, for one, for a telescope that's an F10 telescope. It's the focal ratio that kind of determines this. Yeah, it's not looking too bad. Like I said, it's got one outlier, but the rest of the curve looks pretty good. These SCTs are notoriously difficult to really um, focus well. So I'm going to bet we're going to be at about 208,700, 208,800, somewhere in there. One nice thing about F10 is that you've got a really wide fo uh, depth of field. So... That may help a little bit too. Yeah, it didn't didn't really like that curve very much. I changed this from five thousand down to three thousand five hundred. That was probably a mistake. And I also changed this from eight to six. I think I'm gonna put it back at eight. Then we'll try and do it again real quick. See if we can get a little better curve here. You know, spending a couple extra minutes doing good focus really is, a, is an efficient use of time. Let's see what this focus curve looks like. I'm taking bigger steps between measurements and that should smooth out the curve quite a bit. See, it does not look a lot better right now. That's just three points and already we're starting to get a really nice curve here. 
Sometimes the key is just make sure that you're taking big enough bites that um, you see a difference between measurements. If they're too close together, you don't see enough of a difference between measurements and that confuses it. So that's still not a great curve, but it's much better than the last one.
Okay, so now we're going to start on our next comet. This is kind of uh, more more wester, more westerly than um, I normally hit. So you see, I've got trees that are uh, you know here on the western horizon, but this is up high enough, 58 degrees above the horizon, that it should clear the trees. So we should be able to track this for a while. And we'll get some more. And while that's uh, cooking, let's go ahead and head on over to. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna load up the images. on the other computer and, and run them through Tyco real quick. I'm thinking that's our comet right there. But we'll see. That just looks like a comet to me. The key to it is, is it moving?
Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the comet, right? Just kind of a smudge right there uh, in the center of the screen. I'll put the crosshairs right on it. And then we'll have a look and tell you, you see what you guys think. I think that's it right there. It's the spot where it is. Let me turn the crosshairs off and you have a look at it. It doesn't look like a star. It looks a little bit more hazy, a little more fuzzy. Now, according to this, the only the only positive one that we got was was the comet. Uh, do you guys see um, you guys see Tycho here, or do you still see the computer screen or the telescope screen? And that definitely is the comet. You see it's moving against the background of the stars. So that's a good, that's a good kill. That's a magnitude 16 comet, and we just sent the report in. Anything else here. None of these are known objects. That's the only known object that we found. And that's to be expected. The only other asteroid that was in that area uh, was a magnitude 23 asteroid, and I didn't really expect to see anything, but we definitely got that comet. So that's one comet, and we measured the orbit, and we reported it in. So that's it right there. That's the comet. It's just, it was that object that was just to the uh, left of the crosshairs and just below the horizontal line. So that definitely was the comet. No, it was the one that we thought it was. Interesting. Okay. Like I said, the other asteroid, there is another asteroid in here called uh, 2012 uh, QL14, but that's a magnitude 23.8, and there's no way I'd be able to see that under my skies. Not with my equipment, and I've got pretty good equipment. There's a comet right in the center there. You may not be able to see it very well on your screens, but I can see it on mine. Uh, it's just kind of a fuzzy 
It's a fuzzy dot that's very much not like a star. Yes, you missed the supernova, Dr. Parks. Would you like to see it? Yeah, let me turn that music down a little bit. I had it up when I wasn't talking. Let's bring it down to there for a minute. Uh, give me a second here, Dr. Parks. I'll show you the supernova. Well, first of all, there's the supernova from back in May. You see it's annotated up there on that superior arm, uh, upper left quadrant. And there's actually a mark there on an arrow that says supernova. Now, if we look at tonight's image, let me pull that up. You'll see it is rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise. But where the supernova is, is that little red dot. You see that long arm going out that's got the kind of linear uh, stars uh, towards the tip of it. And then, then as you come back, uh, follow the arm towards the core. You see the little white dot. That's a normal star. Right next to it is a little reddish orange dot. That's the supernova. And that is the current, that's tonight's version of the supernova compared to last May. So there you go, Dr. Parks. I'll send you both of those images so you can compare them.
I think we'll probably shoot another 14 or 15 um, images of this spot and then we'll run it through. Uh, it goes through very, it gets processed very quickly because of the color camera and the, and the binning on it. But we were able to pick it up and since these are three minute images, you know, 14 images is some 45 minutes or so roughly, 44 minutes. So I think that we should be, um, actually it's 42 minutes I would think. So we should have it just fine. You know, that should be enough, enough to get a good, a good orbit on it. So we'll just let her run.
Well, I think when we're done with this one, we're probably going to go over and have a look at the Trifid Nebula, and I want to see how the color imaging uh, of that turns out. I think a lot of this green that you're seeing on this is light pollution from my town here. I don't have a light pollution filter on this camera. I probably should get one. Let's see how many images we have. Yeah, about another nine minutes. Fourteen seems to be enough to be able to track a comet. Especially since these are known comets. And basically I'm just doing orbital updates of them. So by getting their right ascension and their declination on, and, and times for three different points along its path, I can calculate the orbit and then we'll compare that uh, to its known orbit and toss that data in with all the other data that people are getting tonight and the sky surveys are getting and we'll get a little more accurate orbit of the comet. See, this is the bare minimum number that I need is 11. By getting 14, that allows me to have three that I can toss, you know, just on general purposes. Because they're bad images, or their focus isn't right, or a cloud went by, or something or other. The software identifies the quality of the images, and I'll just direct it to toss out the last three, the lowest three quality images. Unfortunately, the only thing that we can see in this, uh, this field is going to be the comet that we're looking for. There are no other asteroids available for us to see. I wish I could white balance this thing.
Nope, not gonna see that. Not gonna see that. These are way too low for us to see. At least out, not out in the west. Or the southwest. We'll try up here. There's the wild duck cluster. That's an open star cluster. Can't see anything over in that sec section of the sky. That might be an interesting target right there. We'll have a look at that next. Another 45 seconds and we'll be done with this one. I want to I want to see what the color camera does. So we'll go over to that other nebula, that little nebula. Okay, so that's that. Got 14. We'll stop the live stack. Let's stop uh, tracking for a moment. Now we'll go right here. See the, see the telescope is slewing over to this target, which is very low in the east. Might be too low for us to get to. Yeah, it's about 15 to 20 degrees above the horizon. Yeah, we're seeing something here.
do a quick plate solve and see if we can get the telescope pointing in the right direction. I don't know if there's going to be enough stars, but we'll see. Still waiting on it to solve. Not enough stars will increase the uh, exposure time from four to eight seconds and try it again. Looks like we got a few more stars now. See, with the higher power views, unfortunately, you don't get quite as many stars, and sometimes it's a little tougher for it to play itself. Probably hit a refocus, too. If it fails this, I'll go over to uh, Nina, do a refocus, plate solve it there with the online plate solver and see if we can get a better, better hit. Yep, still not quite enough stars. Let's take it over to Nina and do it there. Well, let's turn on the camera here. Let's do a quick autofocus. See what we get. So we're starting off with a half flux um, radius value of about 4.2, 4.25. We're going to try and get that down around 2.5. We'll see what we'll see what happens with it. Looks like the focus has changed quite a bit.
Now it's going up to try and find find the focus point. I'm suspecting I've got some dew on the corrector plate. <coughs> I need to go out and wipe that off. I'm getting some uh, condensation on the glass of the telescope. That's why I'm only getting a half flux re uh, radius of just under four instead of around two and a half. The mirrors are, or the glass is fogging. But that looks like it's a focus point right there. So that focus point's probably accurate. If it'll be better once I wipe wipe off the glass. Now my dew strap is not coming until Saturday. Uh, my two current ones that I have are broken and shorted out, so I had to order a new one. Yeah, I've got a focus point. That one, that's pretty clear. Looks like it's going to be about 250,000. So my focus point tonight has gone from 205,000 to 250,000 due to the change in temperature. But this is turning out to be a pretty decent curve, so I've got some confidence in that focus point. Let's see where it put us. Huh. I said 250,000 is 249,999. That was pretty close. Let me go wipe off that mirror. And while we do that, I'll go ahead and plate solve this. And get it over where it's supposed to be.
Yeah, there's quite a bit of dew on the corrector plate. I wiped it off, so we should get a little better focus.
try this out with a three minute image, see if we get any color from the nebula. And there should be a nebula right here. We'll see what the three minute image shows. That's just a four second image. You're not going to get much detail with that. This is the flat correcting in the corners you see the white that's the flat correcting for the normally dark spots there on the longer exposures that evens out and gives everything kind of a uniform background well we'll see what it looks like so everything's got kind of a uniform back black background as you can see let's go ahead and color balance it and then we'll stretch it Try and bring out a little of the detail. Probably too much magnification for it. Let's go see if we've got any objects in here that are of interest. Looks like that disc is getting a little full. We we'll probably need to get rid of some of the older stuff. Let's look at the Nina files here. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here we don't need, like all of it. Now let's go see what that looks like. Still got a lot in there. Let's see if there are any known objects here. Oh, yeah. Quite a few. They're pretty high magnitude, though. I would say our only possibility is these two top ones here at 18.8.
Going to have to take more than uh, 14 images, though. We're going to have to let that run for a while. If I could get those two objects, I think I'd be pretty happy, and it would be a successful test for tonight. My goal was to get to 18.5, so we'll see what we have. We'll just let this run for a while.
What I'm doing right now is I'm running these images through Tyco. Uh, here it's checking the focus and the quality of the images. Now I'm going to go check and see if there's anything moving. Four, let's go ahead and see what it looks like. And there it is.